Just before we begin, I do want to say that this video is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus, a subscription, on-demand video learning service where you can enjoy lectures from top professors from around the world. More on The Great Courses Plus and how you can enjoy a free trial later in the video. From the time of ancient Sumeria, people have feared witches. In fact, the oldest known laws have prescriptions against witchcraft. One such decree is trial by water. Written in the 21st century BC by ancient Sumerians, this law stated that if a man accused another man of witchcraft, the accused should be brought to the river of judgment. There, at the river, the innocence or guilt of the person suspected of witchcraft would be decided. Millennia later, trial by water was still observed. If the accused floated, they were considered a witch. If they sank and perished, they were declared innocent. From the perspective of a modern scientific view, witchcraft and its persecution is merely a product of hysteria. Yet, sorcery and fear thereof is as old as civilization itself. Whatever the true cause of the accusations, instances of witches and witchcraft trials represent some of the darkest moments in human history. Witchcraft trials were rare in ancient Greece, but they did occur. Records of such trials have, however, largely been lost to time. The most intact case remaining is of Theoris of Lemnos, a Greek woman from the Isle of Lemnos who was executed in Athens around 323 BC. Theoris was prosecuted for being a pharmacist, a Greek word which was used for witch. Whilst the word is similar to the modern word for pharmacist, in ancient times the word was used for someone who delivered poisons and incantations. For example, the services of a pharmacist could be purchased to draw down the moon and create an eclipse. Eclipses, associated with great change and symbolism, would usher in panic and allow people with an opportunistic mind to take advantage. In addition to great feats of cosmic manipulation, the role of the Greek witch would also extend to mundane day-to-day -day life, physical fitness, luck, love and healing. For the most part, the Greek witch was tolerated as a necessary, albeit distasteful, element of society. Theoris, however, was an exception. Charged as a sorceress, she and her entire family were put to death. It has even been claimed that she met her end in the flames. The exact nature of her crime, however, has been lost to time. One of the main sources for Theoris's fate is a written extract by Theoris's contemporary, an orator called Demosthenes. Whilst writing about another witchcraft trial in Athens, he referenced the previous trial of Theoris. Describing her as a filthy sorceress, the orator stated that she and all her family had been executed for her vile potions and incantations. The fact that Demosthenes, one of the most famous orators in history, mentioned the case of Theoris in relation to another trial tells us that she was an important person who set a significant legal precedent. Her case and her ultimate fate outlined how future witches would be dealt with. What makes Theoris's case all the more significant is the fact that ancient Greece did not have an arbitrary inquisitorial stance against witchcraft. Athens especially was known for its liberality. There are examples of other witchcraft trials, including those where a pharmacist had accidentally poisoned people with their concoctions, ending in acquittal. Ancient Athens was flexible in its interpretation of sorcery, in particular in its understanding of benevolent versus malevolent sorcery. The fact that Theoris was found guilty and paid for her crimes with her life suggests that the law found her intention to have been sinister. Most likely, this would have been the use of dark witchcraft to end people's lives. Whilst the number of which cannot be discerned through the mists of time, the heinousness of her crimes certainly stayed in people's minds for some time afterwards. 
Whilst in ancient times, witchcraft was viciously pursued if it was thought to have caused intentional harm, Europeans in early modern times persecuted witches on principle. Nowhere is this more evident than in the witchcraft trials that occurred in the Holy Roman Empire, where thousands were tied up and wed to the flames. Rarely was the morality of such violent and widespread persecution of supposed witches questioned. That was until the prosecution of Dorothea Flock in the Bavarian town of Bamberg. Her story was not only incredibly tragic, but symptomatic of everything that was wrong with the witch hunt fever that gripped the times. Dorothea was the second wife of Bamberg's government counsellor, George Heinrich Flock. George had remarried after overcoming the loss of his first wife, who had been persecuted for being a witch, and met the flames in May 1628. In a cruel twist of fate, his second wife, Dorothea, began to tread the very same path in December 1629. Initially, it was an anonymous accusation of adultery that landed Dorothea in prison. After her arrest, she managed to escape, most likely fearing the unreasonable courts of the time and their seemingly insatiable appetite for persecuting women. Unfortunately, she was caught. Only now, she was accused of witchcraft. Tragically experienced after the loss of his first wife, George immediately fled to Nuremberg, where he appealed to Dorothea's highly influential family, the Hoffmans, for help. Together, they contacted influential nobles, religious authorities, and even the Infanta of Spain for assistance. These measures helped delay Dorothea's trial and made her imprisonment more comfortable. They could not, however, secure her release. It was not until George went personally to the Orlick Council, one of the supreme courts of the Holy Roman Empire, that he was able to achieve anything substantial. The council mandated that any decision should be delayed until the birth of Dorothea's child, as she was pregnant when she was arrested. Her pregnancy delayed proceedings until six weeks after giving birth. Once her body ceased to contain an innocent child, it was roughly given over to the witch hunters. They examined her, and under duress, Dorothea confessed to all allegations. During this time, the Orlick Council had also been busy, and had drafted a mandate for her release. Yet, when the mandate arrived in Bamberg, Dorothea's ashes were being gathered from the pyre. The witch hunters, upon hearing that the mandate was on its way, had accelerated Dorothea's execution. Infatuated with what they believed to be a righteous battle against the damnable art of witchcraft, the witch hunters made sure that red-hot pincers and flames were given to Dorothea instead of freedom. After this travesty, a resistance circle was formed in Nuremberg called the Hoffman's Friendship, in memoriam of Dorothea's family name, which rallied broad support against the injustices inherent in witchcraft trials. Christianity had a difficult time settling into Iceland. Despite officially converting to the Christian faith around the turn of the first millennium, its pagan roots remained stubbornly embedded in local culture. Even when the island joined the rest of Europe in persecuting witches, there was still a distinctly Norse quality to its witch hunts. In pre-Christian times, magic had chiefly been a masculine quality. Thus, whilst the rest of Europe primarily persecuted women as witches, Iceland preferred to accuse men. Witch hunt hysteria in Iceland culminated in the late 17th century, in what is referred to as the Age of Fire. During this time, 20 men and one woman met the flames. The charges varied. From raising the dead to causing people and livestock harm, to summoning storms, to inflicting illnesses, to even causing fishermen to have a hard time catching fish, all those accused were said to have used sorcery for dark purposes. Arguably, the Age of Fire would never have been as ferocious if it were not for the case of John Rangvalson. In 1625, John was accused of being a witch. 
the persecution was led by the Danish educated bailiff, Magnus Bjornsson, who had learned of witch hysteria while studying in Copenhagen. In particular, he had read a book about witch trials that had occurred in 1487. This text impacted him greatly, and he brought it back with him to Iceland. As such, when Magnus heard news of a boy having fallen ill, and several horses dying, due to what locals believed to be supernatural forces, he knew that it must have been the evil doings of a witch. Upon questioning, the boy indicated that John was to blame, and so Magnus had the man arrested. When John's house was searched, peculiar pieces of paper with Norse pagan runes inscribed on them were found. At the time, this was regarded as evidence of witchcraft. Tragically, John's fate was sealed by the good intentions of his brother, the poet Thorvald Ramvelsen. He testified that the runes were indeed written by his brother, but that John did not have either the strength or intelligence to employ their power. Thorvald did not understand the way Magnus thought. In his mind, there was no difference between lightly dabbling in sorcery, as Thorvald suggested John did, and inviting communion with the devil. They were equally damnable. Fueled by what he had learned in Copenhagen, Magnus declared that the soul of John needed to be cleansed, and that the best way to clean such a tarnished soul was to strap it to a large, burning stake. With John's death setting a precedent for persecuting witchcraft, others followed. Even though Iceland had long valued the power of white magic and defensive spells, even it could not resist the rigid Christian ideas about witches and malevolent witchcraft that plagued the times. To Europeans in the 17th century, the power of the devil on earth was a very real and tangible force. Evidence of Satan's dark influence was everywhere, as were his agents. One only needed a faithful eye to see it. This belief spread with reverent force from the old to the new world, most especially in the town of Salem, Massachusetts in the year 1692. What would be remembered as an infamous case in witch trial history began when Reverend Samuel Paris's daughter and niece began acting strangely. The girls would contort themselves and fall into fits. Terrified, Paris sought the advice of a minister and a physician. Both agreed that the cause of the girls' afflictions was bewitchment. In due course, several women associated with the Paris household, including a house slave named Tituba, were arrested and questioned. At this point, the accusations may very well have been confined to the Paris household. However, Tituba, fearing that she might be used as a scapegoat, gave a most extraordinary confession. She claimed that she and four others were witches. Her elaborate confession even detailed how she supposedly signed a book shown to her by a tall man from Boston, presumed to be Satan. The house slave told of how Satan and several witches in the area commanded her to do many nefarious things which she did not want to do, such as hurting Reverend Paris's children. She even confessed to having been commanded to end the lives of a local resident, Thomas Putman's sons. Tituba's long and graphic confession shocked local residents. Salem, they were convinced, was diabolically infested. What followed were hundreds of accusations of witchcraft. In order to deal with an incident that was fast spiralling out of control, a special court was established in the area which was presided over by Chief Justice William Stoughton. Stoughton was known to be a zealous man, who had no patience for those accused of cavorting with the devil. Once he set his eyes on an accused man or woman, their destiny was usually concluded in the gallows. So greatly did he desire to cleanse Massachusetts of devilry, that, in one particular case, when the jury found the accused innocent, Stoughton sent them back to deliberate again, until a guilty verdict was reached. During the trials of the Witches of Salem, all manner of absurd evidence was allowed in court. 
Most damaging of all was how a person could claim that the spectre of someone had visited them and caused them harm. This alone was usually enough to send someone to the gallows. In the midst of the chaos of witch mania, some used this as an opportunity to amass wealth, as in some cases, the property of the accused was given to the accusers. Above all, however, it seemed that accusations were made to settle old rivalries and to spite neighbours. Fingers were pointed and tongues wagged at an incredible rate. The dark atmosphere of vindictiveness that descended over Salem can be best felt in the case of John Proctor. John Proctor was a successful businessman who operated a tavern in the area. When his wife, Elizabeth Bassett, was accused of witchcraft, he came to her defence. Proctor fervently questioned the validity of the special court set up in the area, as well as the value of spectral evidence. That he dared to question the authority of the court made him a target. Abigail Williams, Paris's niece, declared that Proctor was a witch. Several others came forward saying the same thing, including his former maidservant. Since Abigail Williams had the trust of officials, having been one of the initial accusers, the accusations were taken seriously. They claimed that Proctor had forced them to touch the Devil's Book, to reject God, and to engage in other, more salacious activities. Proctor defended himself and his wife Elizabeth with great ability and reason. Unfortunately, he did not live in very reasonable times. They were both sentenced to death. Proctor was hanged on the 19th of August, 1692. By the end of the persecutions in September, 14 women, 5 men and 2 dogs had all perished, victims of the zealotry and vindictiveness of the times. Fortunately, before Elizabeth could meet the noose, she was found to be pregnant. This gave her a reprieve until the baby was born, by which time the trials had ceased and her life was saved. Before I go into my final case, I just want to talk about how I quite often receive comments and emails from you asking how it is that I do my research. In the case of the Salem Witch Trials, there was one resource which was indispensable, and that was Professor Douglas O'Linda's fascinating lecture on the Salem Witchcraft Trials, available on The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus has a huge library of over 11,000 video lectures from top professors from the Ivy League and other prestigious universities, as well as from experts from places like National Geographic and the Smithsonian. By using my link in the description, you can get access to all of this courtesy of a free trial. So, if you would like to watch the lecture I did, you can go ahead and do so. As you would expect from a renowned university professor, Linda knows his stuff. Not only does he explore in detail the events of the Salem Witchcraft Trials, but he also delivers many quotations from the trials themselves. And if you would like to learn about something else, then The Great Courses Plus is sure to inspire you just by visiting their homepage, with lectures and courses on everything from history to science to food to photography. In particular, Professor Mark Bergson's course on death, dying and the afterlife has a lecture on the fascinating subject of near-death experiences. There really is no better place on the internet if you like learning. The Great Courses Plus provides an Ivy League education at your convenience, without the pressure of exams and deadlines. And, as I said, you can try it all for free. Just go to thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash paranormal scholar or click the description below. Books can lead to enlightenment, but at other times they can cause death. The mass persecution of witches that occurred across Europe began as an intellectual movement in the 15th century. The incredibly popular book Malleus Maleficarum, that was second only to the Bible in popularity in early modern times, advocated utter and complete extermination of all those who associated with witchcraft. The text's argument centred chiefly on the biblical phrase, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. 
Due in part to the influence of books like Malleus Maleficarum, the persecution of witches permeated all levels of society for hundreds of years. Thus, even in the 19th century, after witchcraft trials stopped being fashionable and were no longer even considered legal in some European countries, grassroots persecution of witches still continued. In 1806, the town of Rezel, in what was then East Prussia, was ravaged by fire. Barbara Zadunk, a local resident at the time of the fire, was said to have a great knowledge of magic and the arcane arts, and was thus blamed by many for the blaze. It was said that she had used sorcery to conjure the flames. One of the theories that circulated as to why she had caused the fire was because of a broken heart. It was said that Barbara was in love with a young man, who was possibly a teenager at the time, by the name of Jacob Oster. He had supposedly spurned the advances of 38-year-old Barbara. She, however, was said to have been infatuated. Such an unconventional infatuation, combined with her known interest in magic, had marked her out as different. Thus, when the fire occurred, she was held to blame. Many even claim to have witnessed Barbara chanting malevolent spells, full of hate, as the city burned. In actuality, it is most likely that Barbara was wrongly accused. Many who have studied the case believe that the fire had been caused by Napoleon Bonaparte's Polish soldiers, and that it would have been politically difficult for those soldiers to be blamed and held accountable. During the course of Barbara's trial, Napoleon had decisively defeated Prussia and its allies. Thus, Napoleon and his army were masters of the area, and even though Barbara's case was escalated to the King of Prussia, nothing could be done. So recently crushed by Napoleon, the King could not risk making a mess of his relations with his new overlord for the sake of a single woman. As such, Barbara had become a convenient scapegoat and someone who could sate the bloodlust of those citizens gripped by witch mania. Thus, in 1811, she was sentenced to death. Before the poor woman could meet the flames, however, her executioner showed her mercy. He strangled her to death. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to take advantage of the free trial being offered by The Great Courses Plus. Simply click my link in the description and gain access to thousands of educational lectures. Doing so helps support the work we do here, so thank you to The Great Courses Plus for sponsoring this video. And as always, thank you again to everyone for watching. Until next time.